why don't you go out the side door over there and go out on the side of the church and just throw up there. So he runs out down the back of the church, and she's like, where's he going? And uh, he comes back. He's smiling. She's saying, did you, did you go outside? No, I didn't have to, Mommy. I found, uh, it said, uh, Dropbox for the sick. Oh, stop. You know you liked it. You know you liked it. Anyway, never mind. I have to give you a Resurrection Sunday joke, right? I mean, all right. I won't tell you which one in the congregation submitted that joke. So, sorry about that, Pastor Mike. You didn't go over her. <laughs> all right. I want to read to you, and those of you that are watching, I want to talk about the ascension of... Uh, of the Lord, and how many were here on Friday? Wasn't that powerful? We, how many of you, you, you're sensing something different since Friday, you know? Yeah, it's Sunday. No, besides that, how many can tell there's something different? I want to read to you the actual account of uh, what the Scripture talks about, of what happened after Jesus was crucified and he uh, rose from the dead, and uh, he appeared to Mary Magdalene. So I want to start with John chapter 20, and I, I just want to read for a little bit. All right, can we do that? Because it's important. We need to be getting in our Bibles. All right, that's what I love about our commander in chief. Did you see his new, the new Bible that's coming out? Make America pray again. It's amazing. You got criticized over it. I'm waiting for others to start criticizing the contrary thing. This is Jesus' visibility day. And I'm going to continue to say it because I know the devil is scared. All right, the first day of the week comes Mary Magdalene early. Now, I want you to notice this. I'm going to pull some stuff out as we just talk about this. When it was yet dark. So notice what time it was. It was dark. I mean, you know, you might be in a dark situation. It might be dark concerning your health, your family. But notice, that's when God shows up and things are resurrected. Just like all of you that we prayed over today. It might be dark, but not anymore. Because God extended his power to you. Now watch this. So it was dark. They went under the grave and they saw the stone. It was taken away from the sepulcher. And she began to run, and she comes to Simon Peter and to the other disciple, that's John, whom Jesus loved, and said unto them, They've taken away the Lord out of the grave, and we don't know where they have laid him. Peter therefore went forth, and that other disciple, John, and they came to the grave. And they both ran together. Now watch this. And the other disciple did outrun Peter. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine John's like, hey, hey, see you, man. You know, John was probably younger. Peter was probably... You know, going like this. It's kind of like when Brenda and I, you know, race. I look back at her and like, come on, keep up. How many of you can outrun your spouse? You know what I told all of our police officers? I said, I could outrun every one of you. Not that I'm criminal or anything, but I'm just telling you, I could outrun them all. Including the big man in the corner there. Right? Because they all have big calves. I watch basketball and football. It's the guys with the small calves that can outrun everybody. So you can imagine, John had the smaller calves. Peter, he was a fisherman. He's over there clunking. You know, he can barely, <laughs> barely keep up, you know. And so anyway, he, they're running, and John's looking back. Peter's dragging. And then comes Simon Peter, and it doesn't say how much time it took him. But he finally got there. But watch this. Watch the difference of personality. So John, he bolts. He runs. He's looking back at Peter. Keep up, old man. Come on. Well, the old man, Peter, finally gets there. But look at what John does. John looks in and saw the linen clothes, but he didn't go in because he had a little bit of a cowardness about him. But here comes this big old strong Peter. Peter went, finally caught up, out of breath. But guess what that boy does? He goes inside. Can you, you notice the boldness of Peter? He goes inside. How many of you, do you think you would have gone into the grave? Now, some people are shaking their head. No, no, no. You're more like John. But Peter, he, he, he goes in there. He's ready. Man, he's probably ready to take somebody out, right? And they see the linen clothes lying there and the napkin that was about his head, but it wasn't lying with the clothes, the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place all by itself. Now, we know what the history is of that. Usually, they would fold the table napkin, set it aside when they would leave, and it was a sign that they would be back. How many know he's coming back? Yeshua is coming back. Jesus. All right, now watch what happens. 
Then they went also, the other disciple went and uh, came first to the sepulcher, and he saw and believed, for as yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. The disciples went away again unto their own home, but Mary stood outside of the grave uh, place weeping as she wept. She stooped down, she looked in the sepulcher and saw two angels in white, the one at the head and the other at the feet. Now, why is that significant? Remember that? Remember the Ark of the Covenant that they carried? Moses, how many of you ever saw the Ten Commandments and they're carrying the Ark of the Covenant? And it, and it literally was a gold box where God's presence would come in the Old Testament with Israel. And they would have an angel on the one side and an angel on the other on top of the box. It was, and it was called the mercy seat. Well, we're going to talk about that because in heaven, that's what Jesus did. He went after he shed his blood, rose from the dead, and he put his blood upon the mercy seat. Isn't that amazing? And so that's what that represented. Look at verse 14. And when she had thus uh, said, she turned herself. Uh, okay, so they talked to her. Verse 13. Woman, why are you weeping? And she turned back and uh, she saw Jesus standing, but she didn't know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said unto her, her woman, why are, you, why are you weeping? Amen. That scripture's for all the wives out there. The husband's question, why are you a weeping lady? <laughs> Except my wife, she doesn't cry like that. Right, Brenda? We'll just leave that out of there. All right, let's go on. Who do you seek? And she supposed him to be the gardener. Now, that's really significant because what happened in the Garden of Eden? Man sinned, called Adam. And so Jesus was coming and fulfilled that because of one man's sin, Adam, we've all sinned. But now... Our sins are forgiven through Jesus. Isn't that good news? Yes. And then she says this, Sir, if you have been born him here, tell me where you've laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said unto Mary, she turned herself and said unto him, Rabboni, which is to say master. Verse 17, Jesus said, touch me not. Now watch this. I've not yet ascended. So notice he's talking about the ascension. He's already been crucified. He's already been resurrection, resurrected, but he said, I've not yet ascended to my father. But now go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto, now notice the sequence. I've not yet ascended unto my father, your father. Now the actual thing that he said there was Abba. My Abba, your Abba. You say, well, Pastor Frank, what's the difference between him saying father and Abba? Well, father is more of a parental title. But what Jesus was using with Abba, it was Aramaic, and he used it in the garden. Many times he spoke it when he was walking, and the Pharisees hated it. They didn't like that God was calling his, Jesus was calling his God Abba. What it means is daddy, papa. So he says, hey, I've not yet ascended to my, my daddy, my papa, your daddy. Now notice what he says, my God, your God. Notice this sequence, and this is what's so powerful about this sequence is a lot of times people only have a revelation of God who is so powerful and he's come to judge and he's come to do all of this. And they don't realize that what Jesus was trying to let her understand is Israel and people only knew God as this distant parental type figure with all this power and authority. But now he's saying, look, when I ascend, it's going to release a personal relationship that you've never experienced before because I'm making the way for you. Isn't that incredible? So verse 17, I've not yet ascended to my father, your father. Now, we're going to talk about the ascension. Most people, how many of you, you, do you really understand what the ascension is? You understand what that means? A lot of times people will talk about the cross. They'll talk about the resurrection. I want you to look at Romans 8, verses 33 to 34. There are three things that we need to understand when it comes to Jesus' visibility day. We need to understand these three things. Now, you have to understand we're going to talk about the ascension. The ascension is that Jesus remained on earth for 40 days after his resurrection. Okay? And then, after 40 days, he told his disciples, he said, Hey, now go into the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. And then, as he was speaking that, he was carried up into the clouds. He began to ascend. And the angels came and said, Why are you looking up? The same one who is ascending, your king, your God is the same one who's going to return again. And how many know that's the hope of what we have? Because he's ascended. But look at, I want you to see this in this one particular verse shows us three things that every Christian, every believer needs to have solidified in their life. Notice number one, who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is it to condemn? 
Christ Jesus is the one who died. Now I want you to put crucifixion. More than that, he didn't just die on the cross, but he is also the one who was raised. Mark right next to that, that's the resurrection. But notice it didn't stop there. Who is also at the right hand of God. That's ascension. So you have the cross, the resurrection, and the ascension. These are three essentials that you have to understand. Who indeed is interceding for us. So let's talk about the cross for a minute. Look at Romans 10, verse 13. This is very important because we're gonna, before we get to the ascension, you have to look at the order. Jesus died on the cross. And it says, whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So it's not by what religion you are, your belief system. It's literally calling upon the name of the Lord to be saved. It's clinging to, trusting in, relying upon him. It's being converted. You recognize that your life is hopeless, lost, without Jesus Christ. And so you have to make a conscious decision and choice at some time in your life to invite Jesus into your heart. And when you do, you'll be saved. And it's not just forgiven, but literally you're given eternal life. But that word saved, it's not just that you get, you know, a mansion in heaven and your sins are forgiven. It literally means health, healing, wholeness, soundness of mind, a blessed memory. Come on, you get long, you get long life, you get preservation, protection, deliverance, kept from danger and harm, rescued from danger. That's all that that word saved means. And that happened at the cross. And I want to show some pictures because oftentimes the movies don't show it to you. And I remember when I was talking to Jim Caviezel, the man who played uh, Jesus in uh, The Passion of the Christ. Show those pictures for just a moment. And I asked him a question. I said, what was it like when you were, you know, having the crown of thorns on your head? He said it did poke in his eyes. Uh, he said he did actually let him whip him a few times. So you can see that Jesus did this for us. It was a very bloody mess. Now hold that picture there. Oftentimes, those of you that are watching around the world when it comes to crucifixion, you see religion wants you to think that it was just a pin drop. They don't want you to see what was worse than that picture. you got to go back to your Bible. The Bible in the book of Isaiah chapter 53 says that Jesus was a lamb led to a slaughter. They slaughtered this man for you and I and for all mankind. It was so ugly that when he was hanging there, barely recognizable as a man raw hamburger meat you could say the organs of his body were were protruding out of him bleeding uh, profusely bruised and battered and yet i think about america how we are the most probably evangelized nation and yet people are not madly in love with the god that did this for us we don't want to listen to anything about him and yet he did this for you in fact, they said when they looked up at the cross and they saw him on the cross, they said that they vomited. They couldn't even look at him. That's what the scripture says. He was marred beyond any human recognition. That's what the word says. Show some more pictures. But I like what Jim Caviezel said. He said the worst thing was is when he was struck by lightning hanging on the cross. He said it was the most intense pain he'd ever felt in his life. But you can imagine what Jesus went through. He went through pain, and yet he was the innocent man. Now, there is good news because all of that suffering that Jesus went through on the cross provided something. I want you to put up Psalm 103, and they're called our benefits. These are things that you have a right to because not only was he crucified, but he was resurrected. People often say, well, what separates your, and they do this, your God from others. I say, well, first of all, he was an innocent man. He was the son of God. And the only way to pay for man's polluted, sinful blood and act was someone had to pay the price and have a sinless, spotless life and sinless, spotless blood. And it's why he had to be born of a virgin because man's blood was polluted with sin. And every man born after them would have the same sinful nature in him. doesn't matter if it's a child or a grown person. But what separates it is not only did he die and bleed, as God coming as a man. But he's the only one that rose from the dead. And there's so many infallible proofs. That's what Jesus' visibility day is about. Amen. That history even records it. Pontius Pilate, the very man who looked at him and pointed his finger and says, Do you know, Jesus, that I have the power and authority to crucify you? By Roman law. And Jesus looks up with his eyes swollen and blood in his eyes and he could barely see and he looks up and he says these words he says you have no power 
unless it had been given to you by my Father in heaven. Pontius Pilate's wife had a dream not to touch Jesus. Her name was Claudia. She became one of the most incredible born-again Christians, history says, and helped out the early church. Pilate washed his hands after Jesus said that. Come on, this Roman figure. He was so gloriously converted that he was converting other Roman soldiers and people in the Roman Empire that they absolutely faked like he committed suicide and made him, made Pontius Pilate, a Christian, die on his own sword. And they said he committed suicide. No, he didn't. So history is full of examples. Here's this man looking at Jesus with those pictures that I just showed you and later got gloriously converted and it messed with him that he actually carried this out. That's what separates our God. But Psalm 103 says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that's within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not his benefits. This is what Jesus provided, all that bloodshed through his crucifixion. And when he went and he was ascended, the Bible said that he carried his blood, his very own blood, into the place where God the Father was so that you could have grace in your life. What's grace? Unmerited favor. Mercy. You don't deserve it, but God gives you help in your time of need. He gives you mercy. Notice what he does. He forgives you of all your iniquities. You know what iniquities are? Purposeful sin. Man, there's people that purposely are bent on not serving God. That's why you you saw the evil that they're trying to rename our holy day. He heals of every disease. You don't have to have sickness in your body. Who redeemed thy life from destruction. Who crowns you with loving loving kindness and tender mercies. This is amazing. This is what he did. He satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. He executes righteousness and judgment for all those that are oppressed. So this is the crucifixion. Now let's, let's swing forward. So Jesus is talking about what happens after he's crucified. And he begins to say, as Jonah is in the belly of the whale. Okay? So shall the Son of Man be in the belly of the earth. So after Jesus died, guess where he went? He went and set captivity captive. He went into a place called paradise and opened it up, went down in the prison cells, opened it up, but he went down and he judged. I want you to see 1 John 3, 8. He went down and he dealt with the devil and every demon. He actually had to suffer in hell as a man on our behalf. So we don't have to go to hell. People are like, well, you don't understand suffering, Pastor Ray. First of all, you never have had done to you what was done to Jesus in his physical body. And thank God, and I pray you never will, have you ever experienced the harshness of an eternal hell where the Bible references it as to losing your soul. You know why it's called losing your soul? This is why. Don't hold unforgiveness in your heart. Bitterness. Okay, forgive people. Don't live a life that shakes your fist against God or, oh, I've heard this before. Well, you've heard it, but you've not done anything with it, and you're a candidate to go down to hell. And Jesus went down as a man into hell, suffered for us so that we don't ever have to. But the Bible, you know why it calls it losing your soul? You know what your soul is? Come on, you ever had somebody where you say, man, they're losing their mind? Okay, your mind is your soul. That's part of it. So people in hell are in such torment that they're losing their mind. They can't get a grip on their thoughts because their thoughts torment them. You know what their thoughts are? Those of you that are watching, you that are in this room, of how many times you listened to a preacher but you didn't respond. How many times that you went to a church that could change your life but you chose instead to go to a weak-kneed church that's woke that tells you a bunch of nothing. When your family member tried to tell you about the church they go to like this that's radical, you won't have any part to do with it. And so part of the torment of losing your soul in hell is all the opportunities you had to forgive and you didn't. All the opportunities you had to make it right with God and others and you didn't. But then it also to lose your soul is to lose your will. You never, ever, 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 ever 
Luke 16, if you want to know what hell's like, Jesus told you, he said there's torments. The worm doesn't even die in hell and it comes out of your body. And it's so hot that they can't even get any satisfaction to cool their tongue like water. That's what Jesus said. But they have no will. You cannot change. There's nothing. It, it, it's eternal. You say, well, why? If God loved us, would he send us there? He doesn't send us to hell. We send ourselves. Because sin and a sinful nature cannot stand in the same place of the holy God in heaven. That's why the blood was shed. And if you call on the name of the Lord, you'll be saved. So here's what the crucifixion does. He that commits sin is of the devil, for the devil sins from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifest that he might destroy the works of the devil. To lose your soul is to lose your mind, to lose your will. But how about this? Your soul is also your emotions. Can you imagine having no control over your emotions? You feel the pain. You feel the suffering and the torment. And it's worse than anything you ever... You know why hell wasn't made for you? Because the man that I just showed you the pictures, put it back up again. He suffered all kinds of physical torment and hell so that you will never, ever have to go there. He went down to hell even. That's where he was at after he, wrote, uh, after he died. They took him off the cross. He went down into hell as a man. So you don't have to. And we're going to give you an opportunity, and those of you that are watching at the end of the service with Pastor Doug, to get your life right. Amen? Let's talk about the resurrection also. What it did is it gave... It provided victory over death. We, when we go to the ground, I used to work with a guy years ago. His name was Mike at an Amoco station when I was, you know, 18 years old. My dad had sold his business. My dad owned the Amoco station after the military career of 20-some, 20 25 years, I believe it was. And I would talk to him about Jesus. And he would tell me, I don't want to hear that beep, beep, beep. He didn't have to be to work until 7, and I had to open the place up at 6. And he would get there right at 6 o'clock while I was opening the place up and torment me every single day, calling Jesus' names, even spitting at me. One day after work, I was vacuuming my car off the clock, and he just happened to pull up, saw my Bible sitting on my 77 Firebird, took it off, grabbed it off the top, threw it on the ground and began to stomp and said, all of this is a bunch of hogwash. Day and night, he tormented me. And I would sit there and I'd say to him, listen to me, Mike. You need to call on the name of the Lord to be saved. God has given you power over sin. You don't have to live your life like you live. And he would judge me. He'd say, you're just a Bible thumper. Well, one day, I'll never forget it, I, was, I had left the Amico place and started pursuing ministry and I was coming back from a missions trip to Mexico. I, th I think that's where I was at. And all of a sudden, I got a call from my old boss. And he said, hey, hey, are you doing okay? And I said, what do you mean? He said, Mike just put a gun to his head and shot himself. I said, I is he all right? He said, no, before he did, he was cursing God. You see, life is serious. It was so serious that God had to come and take on human form so that we could all live a life in heaven with him, but how about this on earth with blessing and a sense of purpose? So I want to read something to you that I think is very important about the resurrection, and then we're going to shift and talk about the ascension. The resurrection, what's powerful about it is truly it shows that Jesus is the Messiah. He is the Son of God. Many, many times the Pharisees would yell at him and say, come on, tell us plainly, are you this God? Are you the Son of God? And Jesus would tell them because when Moses was getting ready to, you know, go and meet with Pharaoh and Moses said, God, I'm not even qualified. I can't even go speak to the king of Egypt. Who am I even going to say has sent me? And God said, I'll tell you my name. My name is I Am. And I am the one that's sending you. And that's what you say to Pharaoh. So many times when the Pharisees would call out Jesus, really, are you the son of God? Come on, plainly tell us. And they couldn't even recognize that he was the Messiah. Just like people today, they just purposely reject the message of Christianity or how about this changing their, their life. And Jesus many times would say, I am, I am, I am. Using the name of God. They say, are you the Christ? I am. In other words, I am God. That's my name. And you're staring right at me. 
But they kept rejecting him and rejecting him and rejecting him. But what the cross did is it provided benefits. But what the resurrection did is it gave us now the right to be forgiven and absolutely live a life completely as a new creature. We don't have to live struggling. We don't have to live as a sinner. We don't have to live hopeless or in despair. But I love this about the resurrection because mark these things down. I'm just going to show you five things, and there's really about seven or eight of them. But the resurrection is about victory. And so maybe you're living a life today where you don't feel like there's any victory. You're like, man, I don't know. Life's a mess. Well, have you met the resurrected Christ? Have you met the resurrected Jesus? Are you committed to him? Yeah, I've prayed that prayer before. Yeah, so have I. But the difference between me and you is pursuit. I don't stop pursuing. I've been serving God since 1984. Forty years I've been serving this man, this God Jesus. And there has been plenty of times that I wanted to shake my fist, quit, give up, try to blame somebody, let alone God, in my life because things didn't work out. Life was difficult. But you know the difference between me and many of you is pursuit. I kept pursuing. I keep pursuing. And as a result... The resurrection gives all of us something. It's called victory. And here's what it is. The first appearance that Jesus had. He goes to Mary Magdalene at the tomb. And she's weeping at the tomb. And she's thinking that Jesus has been lost forever. And her life is lost forever. But you know what? She meets Jesus. Realizes he's alive. And because he's resurrected. It gave her and you victory over despair and hopelessness. The second appearance. Jesus appears to these other women that come. And they have spices. And as they're leaving the tomb, Jesus appears and they begin to recognize that he's the Lord and that he has victory over death. You know what that means? It means we're not going to be like that Mike guy that blew his brains out, that said, oh, well, I don't believe in after death. Listen, when I die, they're going to put me six feet under and I'm going to push up daisies. I said, no, you're not. You are going to continue to live in your spiritual form and state with your soul. And Mike, if you don't accept Yeshua, you'll live forever and ever 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 in eternal torment by your own choice. The third thing that happened with the resurrection is Jesus met up with two disciples on the road to Emmaus and he walks with them, even has dinner with them and they don't even know that he's Jesus. Didn't even recognize him. What is that? That's victory over confusion. Some people are so confused today, they don't even know what truth is. You know, you get into people today, and, and, and I witness to people today, and they always get in these philosophical uh, arguments. And I always tell them this. I say, the reason why you want to go the philosophical route is because you don't understand the way of salvation. It's not through your head. It's through your heart. Jesus was talking to a man in Mark 14, and he said, Jesus, tell me the greatest commandment. And Jesus said, well, I'll tell you, you can wrap the Ten Commandments in two. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's the first half of the commandments. If you love God, you'll attend church. If you love God, you won't speak and use his name in profanity, right? You'll have no other gods before him. Then he said the second commandment is you should love your neighbor as yourself. What, what does that mean? Well, that's the other ten commandments. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal, right? Don't kill. And he said this. And the man looked at him. He said, he said yeah, Lord, I know that I should do these things. And Jesus noticed that the man answered his question intelligently. And he looks at the man and he says, hey, because you answered from your head, I say these words to you. You are not far from the kingdom of heaven. Anytime you've got to get into physical debate, you know, nobody really needed to give me any kind of physical evidence. Nobody had to debate me whether is it possible for a man to be born of a virgin or not. If you're still doing that, you have not submitted your heart. Because soon as I realized in my life that I needed a Savior, and I recognized that a man was beaten, bruised, bloodied, whipped, an innocent man for me, my heart cried out and said, my God, if somebody did that for me, and I'll never forget it. I was in my parents' basement in 1984. I knelt down and I said, Jesus, if you're real, come into my heart and forgive my sins. And as soon as I did that, I felt something that I had never felt in my entire life. And I've been the same sin. Forty years later, I've been fulfilled with God. Him and I are great friends. The fourth appearance of Jesus, he appeared to his disciples when they were hiding together. He gives you victory over fear. The fifth appearance is Jesus appeared to all 11 remaining because he gives you victory over doubt. Now, what I want to talk to you now is remember the cross 
the resurrection and the ascension. I want you to look at Luke chapter 24, verses 50 through 52, as I wind my message down here today. So Jesus, after he is crucified, he goes down into hell. He stays upon the earth for 40 days. And he begins to literally make himself known to the people at that time. And look at Luke 24, verse 50 through 52. And it said, he led them out his disciples as far to Bethany, and he lifted up his hands, and he blessed them, and it came to pass while he blessed them that he was parted from them, and notice he was carried up into heaven, that's the ascension, and they worshiped him, and returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and, and he led them out as far to Bethany, and he, again, he, he ascended on high. So you've got to understand, that's the ascension, but before that, there were 40 days, and let me give you some examples of what Jesus did. So the first thing after he rose from the dead, the the first person he appeared to, yell it out. Do you know who it is? Okay. Does anybody know who the last person he was that he appeared to? All right. I'll see if you get it. So the first person he appears to is Mary Magdalene. Then he appears to the women that we mentioned with the spices. He then appears to two believers on the road to Emmaus. Then he appears to Peter, and he begins to settle the fact. Peter, uh, I've changed your name. You're not a coward. He appears into the apostles behind locked doors. Then he appears to the apostles, including doubting Thomas. And he said, listen, Thomas says, man, unless I put my hands upon his nail scars and thrust my hand into his side, I won't believe. And you know what I've always wondered? Everybody has diced that, that up. Oh, he just didn't have enough faith. Jesus did exactly what he was asking. I, I asked the Lord one day. I said, I just want to know. I want to know Jesus. Just, I want to see. Show me something that will change my life forever when it comes to your crucified body and what you went through. And I'm thinking he's going to give me a vision and I'm going to see the, the crucifixion, right? And I've been asking him. I said, Lord Jesus, I want to be just like Thomas, man. I'd love to put my hands where your nail-scarred hands are. I, I would love to thrust my hand under your side. You didn't rebuke him for that. You actually fulfilled it and said, now you doubted. And I'll never forget it. It was a few uh, Saturday, it was a Saturday before the resurrection service. How many of you have a hobby? Okay, some of you don't need to get a hobby. You all are serious today. Are you all okay? <laughs> so anyway, I was worshiping God. I, I, I have HO trains, you know, trains, uh, and I'm a big hobbyist. And I was down there and I was working on my layout and I was worshiping God. And I just kept saying, God, I thank you for. Jesus, what you did with your suffering. And all of a sudden, I felt the room. Something changed. And I, was, I knelt down by this chair. And all of a sudden, as I was kneeling down, the chair was here. Two feet appeared right in front of me, and I saw the holes. And you, you say, well, what did you do? Did you lift your head to look? I couldn't even lift my head. Because when I saw those holes in his feet, I was undone. And I remember burying my head towards those feet as close as I could get. And I was crying and crying and crying. And I remember I said, I said, Jesus, I never have to see your face. I never have. That in itself satisfies the fact and the understanding of what you did for me. Now, you may not have that kind of experience, but I'm telling you, man, what he went through was so amazing. All right. So he appears to uh, the apostles, including Thomas. He provides a miraculous catch of fish. He reconciles with Peter. Then he commissions his disciples to teach and baptize all nations. And then he appears, watch this, to 500 people at the same time before he ascends. But there was still one more person that he had to meet with. Who was it? Nope. I want you to look at 1 Corinthians 15, 7. There was one person that he had to get to before he would go up into heaven and ascend. You know who it was? After that, after the 500, he was seen of who? James. James. You know who James is? His family member. Notice, sometimes it's not the Pontius Pilate's. Sometimes it's our very own family member. It's the very thing that in my family. And if my brothers or sisters are watching today, for years they treated me like the black sheep of the family. All because of my Jesus My relatives are watching. They've done the same thing. We'd get together for reunions, and it was very obvious. They'd all huddle and cuddle together, and they didn't want me or my wife. Why? I love them. 
because of your Jesus. Jesus realized that the hardest person sometimes to convince is your own family members. And he went to James before he ascended. James was seen. He was seen of James. That was the last person that saw him. Now, why is this important? Go to John 7. You need to look at verse 5. There's hope for your family members. There's hope for you. I remember when I told my dad that I wanted to be a preacher. He didn't want me to be a preacher. Now, when he's in heaven, he said, man, he was so happy that I preached. He used to watch me on live stream. Thank God for live stream. All right. Now, watch this. Neither did his brethren believe him, especially James. James, his oldest brother in the natural, was always the ringleader thinking Jesus was crazy, thinking he lost his mind. And Jesus said, man, I'm not going to go up to be with my father until I go talk to my brother James. Now, you got to understand something about James. Everybody, is, is this an okay message? Are you all good? So you got to know something about history about James. So James was, after Jesus appeared to him, he lays his hands on him. He prays over him. James was undone. And his life was so radically converted by his brother, by his Lord now, Jesus, that he goes back and he begins to become the leader or the pastor, apostle over the Jerusalem church. That settled the dispute, remember, between the Gentiles and the Jews. It was Jesus' brothers that settled it. But here's what's so amazing. Do you know how big that church was? I've heard people say, well, you know, those mega churches. Well, um, you won't like heaven because it's one mega church. <laughs> and, and second, uh, 120 in an upper room went to 3,000 mega to 5,000 mega to great numbers. James, the apostle, oversaw in Solomon's porch. People say, well, it's just about house churches. Wait a minute. They met in the house and the temple. And do you know the temple court, Solomon's porch? How many ever been there in the natural? It can fit over a hundred and some thousand people. And the Jerusalem church would meet there. And it was over a hundred thousand converts that were part of the Jerusalem church that James was the apostle. So you got to go 30 years after Jesus ascended. And the Jews are so upset because they're losing grip on their their religion that denied that Jesus rose from the dead. And so they pulled James aside, the leader of 100,000 people, and they say, James, listen, you need to settle this with us. So they invite him to the temple. They put him up on a wall, and they said, James, you, you, can, you can, you know, talk. You can do whatever you want, but here's the thing. You, can, you, you, you have great influence so we're going to give you an opportunity to speak. Or he kind of took his opportunity. He gets up on a wall. They led him actually up to this wall. And it's a really high wall. And he begins to preach about his brother, Jesus, who is and was in fact the son of God. And he was crucified, resurrected, and he ascended. And when he began to say that, they stormed him, the Jews and the priests, and they went up on the wall, and they threw him off of this wall. This is what history tells you. And James fell. They, some say it was like 60, 70 feet. He fell, and he landed. He, and, and, and he landed, and, he, and, and can I tell you what happened? History says he fell, he, he, he fell, you know, 70 feet, and he gets up, and he's wobbling, and he's bleeding, and he gets up, and he does. How many remember Acts 7 when Stephen was being th throwing stones at him? He gets up after being thrown off the wall by the priests and by the Pharisees. And James, Jesus' brother, stands up and he begins to say, Father, hold this not to their charge. Forgive them. They were so mad that he was calling for forgiveness that a, a man comes out with a wooden rod and smacks James and literally busts his head open, and he goes, and he's laying on the ground, and blood is protruding from his head, and he dies. His, 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 his family is so distraught at what happened with James that they rush up to him thinking there's a possibility that we could save him. He's dead. And they, you know, can I tell you what history says? They looked at his body, and they began to say, forgive him. As they're looking at the lashes and, and, and the broken bones and the, you know, lacerations from the fall. But you know what got their attention over everything? 
This is written in history. It was not the lacerations. It was not even the fall and the broken bones of our brother James that we took notice on his body. It was his callous knees as he was a man of prayer. The last person Jesus went to. There was others. We're almost done. Pastor Doug, you can come. Acts 1, 6 through 11. Others testify of Jesus' ascension. And when they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, when will you at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times and seasons which the Father has put in his own power, but you'll receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you'll be my witnesses. And as he was speaking, verse 9, he was taken up. He began to be in a cloud ascend out of sight. And while they steadfastly looked towards heaven, he went up, and behold, two men stood by him in white apparel, which said, You men of Galilee, why are you standing gazing up into heaven? Because the same Jesus who came to you shall return again. I want to have you look at just a couple more verses, and we're going to be done. The ascension, Hebrews 10, 12. This is what you have to understand. This is why James, his own brother, struggled. Hebrews 10, 12 says that it was the man Jesus You say, well, what happened when he went up into the clouds? Again, you have the crucifixion where he shed his blood. You have the resurrection. He went and set those that had to wait for the Messiah who believed in God, but the Messiah had not yet paid for their sins. They had to be released so that they could live forever with God. They were in a place called paradise. But then he also went down into hell and punished the devil, tormented the devil. But then he now ascended. But when he ascended, this is what you have to see that gives you hope today. Because the Bible says in Hebrews 4, we can come boldly now to the throne of grace. And we can receive grace, mercy, and help. So whatever your situation is because of Jesus' ascension, you have grace. Undeserved, unmerited favor. Don't ever come to God saying you're not worthy. Don't ever come and say, look at me, I'm just a sinner. I'm a failure. Don't ever say that. Because he ascended. He's seated at the right hand of God. And you are a joint heir with him. And Jesus, the Bible says in Psalm 110, When God prophesied about Jesus' son, sit thou at my right hand. You know why it was the right hand? Because everyone knew that when the king would name or acknowledge his successor, he would put him at his right hand. And God the Father did that as Lord of all, set a place at his right hand for the king of kings and the Lord of lords to sit there forever. But what Jesus said now is we're seated with him in heavenly places. You have victory over any situation or problem because of the ascended Christ that is seated at the right hand of God the Father. Isn't that beautiful? But notice what it says. But this man, after he offered one sacrifice for sin, forever sat down on the right hand of God. I want you to stand to your feet because you know what that means for you and I? It means we have benefits that at any time we can exercise in our life. And it's important that you understand something about the ascension. When Jesus ascended and he carried his own blood, he went into as a man, representing us, fully God, fully man. And he walked in carrying his blood and he put it upon that mercy seat. Remember the two angels. And God the Father looked at him and said, Thou art God. Hands him a scepter of righteousness. He says, sit thou at my right hand and all thy enemies will be your footstool. This is why, like this Wednesday, when we pray for America, we pray for the nations. We must pray from the place of authority of the ascended Christ that all enemies that are wanting to steal, kill, and destroy have no power to do so because we have that power delegated to us now. I want Pastor Doug to come. He's going to lead us in a short prayer. I'd ask that you not leave going to get you out here just a couple minutes early.
There is a speed bump on the front. 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 